where, where are the others? They're gone. They're still playing with their avatars, I think. Hi, Shopware crowd. Great. The most important thing Claire didn't say, I'm here for the 10th time now. 10 times Shopware Community Day. How, how often are you here? Who is here for the first time? Okay, second, third, fourth. Oh, okay, the rest of you I know. <laughs> and those who are here every day. We're talking generative AI and we have four guys on stage. It's Stefan Hamann, Mark Stanley, Man and Dave, and Brian Lange. Welcome. <clears throat> and the guy who came fourth, you didn't have on your program. That's why, or it's because today it's the start of the end of his life. <laughs> and it's not a serious topic, it's just what he told us downstairs. He said, okay, after my job and after I'm finished with everything, my profession will be to sneak in everywhere. So now here he is, <laughs> Brian. No, actually he's of course invited. Brian is a co-founder of Future Commerce. So if you still have time to read something or to hear podcasts, head for Future Commerce um, and we will hear a lot from him um, about a big picture of generative AI. So how this goes into society or shopping habits and things like that. And that's what happens on Future Commerce. It's not only about high tech, it's also about low mentality and emotions and uh, how people behave and how that fits together. So next to him, we have Manon Dave. Manon Dave is Chief Creative Officer at Mind Valley. Hi Manon. And he's a composer. I do. I make music too. You make music. <laughs> we'll, we'll have that in a second. Then Mark, uh, no, Stefan Hamann. Oh, do you sit the opposite way around? Hold on. Yeah, we <laughs> out. You know Stefan Hamann? You do. Really? Did you miss him in the keynote? No, no, we couldn't tell you. Sebastian, bist du da? <laughs> no, we can't tell him. Seven CEO of Shopware, of course. And then Mark Stanley on the right hand side for you. He's a new CTO of Shopware. And, That's uh, me. Sorry? That's me. Yeah, sure. I'm talking of you. <laughs> or is it your avatar I'm talking to? Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have about four a bit different roles. So I. Our role for Brian is a bit the consumer side. So um, if we look at the consumers and their behavior in online shopping, how can generative AI affect the customer journey? Or what do consumers need? What we can give them with generative AI? Then we have, of course, a bit more of the creative part in there. Does it really matter if I try Dali, nothing good comes out? Um, maybe it's different for men. Then um, Stefan talked to me last week about the deep business side of AI, which is all with big data. You know, something like product data, for example, and how it can help with that. But even it can, generative AI can bring big data and the essences out of it to people. It can talk to people. So finally, we understand the reports the IT department gives us, <laughs> if they're composed with generative AI. And then on the right-hand side, Mark, um, actually, um, th this is the very, I think the most interesting part because Mark comes from another planet we talked about last year, the foundation of the metaverse. Uh, anyone still remembers what the metaverse was? Mark does. Not, not really. Mark, Mark comes from, actually, one of his jobs was um, uh, at, at the PlayStation team. And so he has profound um, knowledge about everything what is immersive and the depth of technology and maybe a look into the future, how things will uh, come together, man and machine. And we start with that. Um, just for the first glimpse on generative AI, um, how do you all see it from your subjective position. Mark, start. Yeah, as I said earlier, I think um, we're entering a, a, a new wave of a ph phenomenal amount of specialized tools that can do very interesting and specific things. And I think there's going to be lots of practical applications for them, for people, but it's going to take a lot of work to get them to do the things you want to do. I mean, we did a competition for the developer day 
where we set this goal to create the Shopware logo, Cody, our mascot, and the results were absolutely wild and insane. So in the end, you know, the, the, the winners had to create these really, really massive command line prompts with negative ones to not do this, and then we ended up getting something similar to, to what we expected. So yes, super interesting tools, but you've also got to know what you're going to do with it, I think is the, the main point. Oh, okay, we'll discuss on that. I'm not your opinion, but um, let's head that to Stefan because it, uh, it goes exactly in the direction we talked about last week. You told me that um, e-commerce people are not that fast in adopting new technology and experimenting. They try to, you know, they have low margins. They try to stick to efficiency ideas and things like that. That's not about experimenting. If it is as hard, if the learning curve is as steep as Mark mentions, how are uh, e-commerce people able to adapt to generative AI, to users? So first of all, I think it's uh, really interesting to see that uh, we are now, let's say, getting away from uh, this AI bullshit marketing things that we saw the last, uh, don't know, 10 years or so. So in every event, everybody was like very deep in, into AI, right? And I always ask me the same question. So what is basically the advantage? So what is basically getting optimized and, and changed um, to help merchants be more efficient or creating more compelling um, experiences? And yesterday, I also talked to somebody and said, two years ago, um, nobody really was aware about uh, GBT3 or something like that. It was still or already available. But nobody, nobody knows about it, right? And what, what for me really is uh, the main difference now with uh, ChatGBT, I would say that probably 90% of the people here have already experienced how good it is working, right? And that helps a lot in thinking about, okay, how can it be adapted uh, for my individual online shop or for my individual uh, digital business model? And that is a major uh, difference and something that really helps, I think, in. Uh, yeah, making sure that the technology is not seen as technology alone, but is seen as an uh, advantage that makes our uh, lives hopefully a little bit less stressful. Okay, if I take your, two, your both comments, we could discuss on those two for the rest hour because they're not in line with each other. <laughs> I don't agree with you at, as well, but um, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Just let's sum up the round. Menon, how about you? We just were downstairs throwing tools names around as foolish as we could be. Let's take your, your profession. Let's take music. We talk about um, generative AI in text form, we talk about images, but we talk a bit about uh, videos, avatars. How about music? Can tools create music on their own? Well, um, first of all, awesome to be here. And hello, everybody. Thank you for being so welcoming. And uh, by the way, I'll be at the bar later. I know we're very close now, so you're almost there. Just hold on a few minutes longer. Um, yeah, I, um, I really do think that um, Music is around the corner. I think if you, anybody who's been keeping a track on everything will see that video is already emerging. People are seeing generative video or text to video um, all over Twitter. Um, music has always been a bit of an anomaly because there's such a human component to it and arguably the same with text, with imagery and other things. But I think with music, um, what we're seeing is that it's more uh, of a challenge, I think, to dissect composition than it is voice like voice seems to be where a lot of the things that are trending online like the you know somebody making a drake song and putting it on spotify uh voice is something that is moving very fast and now that we think about it quite obviously so because voice tech has been floating around for a few years uh in the machine learning world but when it comes to actual composition and the nuanced choices uh, i think it's harder to completely replicate and have the same I guess, uh, texture and feeling that we, we get when we listen to a great composition. But I think that actually it's going to do what I feel it's doing in, for example, the development space right now, which is become a, I, I think it's aptly named in Shopware's uh, product roadmap, a co-pilot, right, or a co-creator. So I think that's where we're headed with, uh, with generative AI on the music side is, uh, as somebody who makes music but is definitely nowhere near the best uh, 95% in the world, probably bottom 5%, uh, I, I could use these tools to really help me imagine what I'm trying to achieve a lot better. 
Great. So if you find a good tool, send it to us, and we'll bring a new song to the European Vision Song Context. <laughs> I think we have a very low level to cope you with. You guys are overdue a we win. Can only, we can only do better. Brian, um, from the user perspective, um, we talked about user behavior and, and emotions towards shops, and um, we, we said, okay, they, in, in the e-commerce industry, everything is done, you know, every, everyone knows how shops work, and if, if you find the product you want to, then you get things done. Where should then be place for amelioration? It's a good question. Uh, I think uh, before we think about how people are going to use AI as they shop, we have to take a little bit of a step back and think about why AI. What is the what is the the value and wh where does it affect people? Um, and there was a book written in 1950 called *The Human Use of Human Beings* by Norbert Wiener. And in this book, he perfectly predicts the sort of the arc of how AI would progress. Um, his thesis is that uh, he, so that there are some interactions that should be machine to machine, some interactions that should be machine to human and some interactions that should be human to human. And what we need to do as merchants and sellers in order to understand how our customers are gonna be able to engage with not just AI, but, but technology in general, uh, is understand where, those, where, where what we do fits into those classifications. And I would argue that recently, in, in the past 50 years, ever since, We've been creating software uh, and, and machines. Um, there's a spectrum of communication between human and machines. And on one side, you have machines that speak and interact a certain way. And on the other side, you have humans that speak and interact another way. And we've actually been conforming ourselves to machines. And actually, the communication layer is closer to machines. So that's coding. That's fulfilling an algorithm of creators on social media trying to chase the algorithm. Um, and what AI is allowing us to do is move the communication spectrum back towards humans where it belongs and allow us to function the way that we should function as humans. So we can use a more natural dialogue to interact with machines. And so as we think about shopping journeys, and how we're going to like, I mean, consumers are going to interact with our e-commerce stores. Let's be honest, e-commerce has been kind of the same for a long time. And we have all trained our customers. They've been trained by all stores on how to interact with these interfaces that are actually not very human and are kind of depressing. And I wrote about this extensively. I'm shopping on Black Friday, scrolling by myself and on my phone for hours on end, looking at deals since it's a big US shopping holiday. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, it's actually not, it's not what, we, what we are, we're designed to do. And so when we think about AI and how it's going to enable us to shop, um, we can start to think about use cases for it, giving humans a more interactive way to engage, aka back to conversational commerce, but in a good way. Um, it's been uh, the only way that it's been imp implemented well has been through human to human interaction. But with human to AI interaction, we can now potentially shop alongside brand uh, AIs that are trained on brand voices and on products. And, and, and we're going to be able to interact with the, the products the way that uh, you as a brand are going to want to set up or you as a retailer are going to want to demonstrate those products and, and even shop alongside our friends and our crea creators and people that we respect, people that have died, that have public facing data. <laughs> um, so you may be able, there's a tool called Shop with AI that was just released in, in the US and it was um, covered in Vogue and they're training uh, dead celebrities uh, or they're training this AI on dead celebrities, and you are actually going to be able to shop alongside, say, JFK, and get his viewpoint on the, the clothing that you're buying as you go, um, and actually have him build out your cart for a specific event. So things like that, where it's much more human, I've said enough. <laughs> that, was, that was a long talk with a couple of topics in it, and we got to pull that out of each other. The first thing is, Stefan, um, if, what Brian says is right, and, and uh, there is a need for uh, any other type of navigation, let's call it that way, um, 
isn't that something that Google will take over for us? So um, in, in the end, if, if we see from Google I.O. two weeks ago, if we see this, this uh, um, search engine landing pages, it has this big um, um, department where Bart says, which is a good product and whatever. And in the end, people then click through to, to just only buy. And all of our content marketing that's in the shop goes away. Yeah, let's, let's maybe from, uh, uh, yeah, from our mindset fast forward a bit. Because of, I think, let's say in five years or maybe six, uh, six or seven years, it will basically be that uh, commerce will split up in two kind of domains. So we will have, uh, I'm pretty sure, a kind of a pers personal assistant. So everybody out here that will take care about ordering all the things we don't want to spend time on, right? So it's, I think uh, nobody is super engaged in buying uh, toilet paper, for instance, right? So you just want some. And it is something that can be automated and it will be automated. But the, that's the next gatekeeper. Um, so, so the first assistant we will have will be an intelligent browser. We'll, yeah, basically, like that. you are right, yeah. But the funny thing is, I think we will also have um, another domain and that will be pretty much about um, individualization, about, let's say, experiences about all the different kind of hobbies that are out there, right? So where people love to spend time on. I would mm -hmm. say it's basically split it up. We have commerce that is like, a don't, yeah, don't creating much engagement and much um, bringing much value to our lives. And on the other side, we also have things, aspects, industries, areas where we are super, um, yeah, super engaged and, and really want to spend time on. And I think that is, um, really important for, for a long-term understanding and also for um, yeah, making sure what is, let's say, as a merchant, what is my position in this new world, right? Um, on the one hand, uh, heavily automated um, and on the, on the other side, still like very much about uh, tailor-made and curated content, about bringing like this emotional aspect of products right. to, to a customer. Um, yeah, and that is pretty pretty interesting that's that's the two streams we have already we have they they've been around all the time let's it's like the the surfer people that you know stroll around and and let uh, are being in, inspired and on the other hand the seeking people that are very direct in the, in their um in, in their attitude in their mode and um yeah. that's what you say so it goes deeper in both segments yeah and i would say it's also if you think about um let's say a word perspective on 1000 shopware shops you would see that basically uh, a lot of them are, are still very technical. That's not a bad thing at all. As for a B2B shop, for instance, I think it's, uh, it's okay uh, somehow, but um, in the end, I would say everybody who is currently differentiating uh, by price, by availability of products and such, let's say, uh, yeah, easy to, to copy kind of USPs, uh, that will not, will not work in this uh, future where like the web browser or the personal assistant or whoever uh, is taking care of automating something um, that will not require let's say a listing in an online shop anymore right? yeah that's and and that's i think uh, sorry mark to, to not let you talk but, um, that's okay. that, that that's the most obvious thing for for all of our crowd here that we will save so much money and time on adapting brand content to our uh, merchant websites um, which is always been a huge problem duplicate content and, and things like that you don't always know which product should I um, adapt all or only part of it yeah. and, and that's obvious yeah yeah I mean and let's say if you think it uh, again maybe a bit further then you can basically say it's, as I see it like uh, like a front end right so but it's not really human don't know optimized front end it's more like that there is a certain API uh, endpoint basically and that connects uh, your shop your product catalog with this kind of AI assistance services in the future and what, where you can really spend time on and where it is really worth the money is then creating this kind of, let's say, experiences, maybe things like spatial commerce, 3D shopping, all the different things that uh, can help in the future to make like your products and your brand um, much more interactive and much more like compelling in, yeah. a, in a way, right? Mark, a age ago you wanted to comment. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to jump in on that. Um, I, I think you can't really underestimate the kid in the candy store factor. And I think that, that you know, 
certainly I can talk about myself, like I, I, I want to be shown something, I want to be guided through something, I want to see something, I want to experience something. And I think um, it's not just also about being on a website either. I think it's about it traveling with you to the different endpoints wherever you go. So I think it can think much, much bigger and more consistent and over a longer period of time. That's where I think a lot more of these things will come in and it will be much more personal, relevant, and you'll have much more interactions with it. But the, the thing you mentioned uh, before in, in uh, your first answer, when I disagreed, was that uh, it would take some time um, till people get adapted to these tools, um, till they know how to use them um, in, a, in a, you know, vivid manner. Um, if we see the development right now, development speed, we, we have one tool coming out each day. But what we hear of one, uh, I think it's 10 every, every day. So things will, will develop very fast into easy to use interfaces, won't it? Uh, yes, but it also depends what, what, what does good look like for you, right? I think that's the key question. So if you're trying to achieve something specific, you might be able to get a mediocre result straight away. But if you want to make it something much more in depth and much more compelling, you've got to learn how to use the new tool in a new way. That's basically my point. The new job of prompt engineering. Let's, uh, let's talk about, to that uh, with Manon about um, deeper creativity than, than text. Um, how, how do you see this, the, the tools landscape evolving? If we talk about you know, great creative tools like Photoshop and whatever, um, they have had easy to use interfaces once a while, time ago, um, but will things change more to a client-server architecture and, and less tools on, on the hard disk? I think it's actually going to get um, even more, you know, uh, enriching because uh, so uh, in another life, um, first of all, I'll start by saying this actually, advertising, digital advertising, uh, e-commerce, uh, many of the folks in this room have always been, to be honest, a step ahead when it comes to uh, adopting what we are calling today AI tools or you know machine learning approaches or techniques. Uh, in another life, 15 years ago, I guess 2007 to 2014 ish, uh, 2013 ish, um, I, I worked in ad tech and I was uh, building you know performance marketing tools, behavioral retargeting tools for companies like uh, AWIN Global. I was actually their first product manager. Skim links where we did like a semantic decomposition uh, algorithm, which basically in context created those super annoying pop open banners. Um, I was one of the super villains before uh, the EU cookie law to, yeah, to, to, to parade the internet with everyone's cookies. So we, we used to use that, right, to create, put your hands up if you remember carousel banners. I guess some of you maybe even still use them with this. <laughs> I mean, everyone here is about 10 years old, that means, but uh, yeah, so uh, a couple of people at the back. No anyway. one wants to talk about that anymore. <laughs> so, so, but that was personalization. That was AI driven, you know, targeting based on behaviors. And in those days, I was like, as a product manager, oh, what about if we could tell how long they open that one image for in the Amazon, you know, the Amazon carousel of images. Because if they open it for seven seconds, maybe they're more interested than if they open it for three seconds. And then all of this kind of folded into us building the tools to then create the, make the creative that we would use to stalk these people on YouTube on the side banner later on, right? That then moved into the YouTube window with, uh, you know, with the video ads and and uh, influencer ads on TikTok and Instagram and so on that we have today, still targeted, although the content is being uh, generated by human beings, the creative is really thought through and put together well, and, uh, or argue, arguably well. And then, um, and then I think now where we're headed is, I mean, I already know for a fact that there are some of the big five, six companies in the world are working on adaptive generative video ads, meaning uh, same process that we follow from 15 years ago of like tracking, uh, provided you press accept, which I'm sure most of you do on these websites, uh, you know, uh, tracking your behaviors, understanding what you want to buy, instead of putting it in a banner ad, putting it in a video ad, same way. But this time, what if it is actually your living room, which the sofa gets put inside and is shown to you, you know, as you're, as you're about to watch the um, Drake video, which I know many of you are fans of. 
here. Uh, so, um, you know, that's kind of where we're headed. It's going to be the tool set that allows you to create the creative uh, at hyper speed and hyper relevancy. I think that's, that's where we're I headed. See, I, I, see, I see a regulation called GDPR, which goes a bit against the idea. And if I read the newspaper right today, um, then uh, Mr. Altman um, <laughs> said he could opt out of Europe um, if the EU would. Um... Listen, Brexit's not a bad thing. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, no, yeah. <laughs> You think that's right? Okay. Um, our time is already up. Brian, um, if, if we look into um, the, your vision of a future um, e-commerce um, online shopping experience, how, how would it look like um, composed from generative AI? Yeah, so if we were to look really far into the future, and maybe this isn't that far actually, <laughs> uh, it, I think that the, the opportunity here, um, I'm going to go back to the human use of human beings and Norbert Wiener, he said that we are going to outsource judgment and decision making to AI. And if you if you think about Marshall McLuhan and his viewpoint of you know as the medium is the message, and you know and and how uh, our technology is an extension of our bodies, like the wheel is an extension of the foot, um, and then AI would actually be an extension of our minds. And so ultimately. I think we're gonna see proxies that are trained on our data uh, that we're going to, and we're gonna bring our own algorithm, if you will, to the world. They're gonna have budgets, they're gonna do things on our behalf. We aren't built to interact with technology the way that we are currently today, and so we're going to build technology to do it for us. And that will be way more efficient, and it's going to uh, free us up to push the boundaries of what we're capable of creatively which is what we really want to be doing. So then um, a, bit more, a bit more concrete down to mm -hmm. the point. If you talk to these people and they're still critic, in a critical mode, they still don't know, should I go into generative AI? What should they do to evaluate that your point could be right? I think if you're not using generative AI right now, you are missing the train. So you, you, there's there's no question. Don't evaluate. Germans it. are used to missing. Trains. Do it now. <laughs> uh, if you're if you're not using it in your business, there's three ways to use it right now. One is internal, uh, and to spur innovation and move through cycles of creation internally faster. The second is to to do it in a way where you use it to publish things. And we saw some tools and shopware today that are incredible, where you can use it to create publishable content and publishable uh, you know, uh, tools. Uh, and that will require some level of human intervention and like analysis before it gets out the door. And the final way is live interaction with AI. And that's the place where maybe you do need to do some evaluation because of regulation because of where AI is at right now, um, live interaction is probably the most, most controversial and the place where you need to be most careful right now. But if you're talking about using it to publish or create, now is the time and Shopwork is gonna make it happen. I, can I, I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll just add one thing. Uh, you know, uh, anybody who was in Cassie's talk earlier, she mentioned mm -hmm. that if there were two, if there were two teams working in your business, one was pure engineering, one was engineering plus design, uh, and you put them to the task of ge using generative AI or AI uh, to, to deliver something, she would back the team with the, the creatives, right? And the reason why I fully agree with that and why I, uh, you know, I've, I've heard a lot, I've been on a few panels in the last few months and heard a lot of uh, business owners say, you know, we're gonna close all open roles we're also very much considering, you know, uh, the roles that we actually need within the teams we have. Um, I think that's, I take the opposite of, approach. I, I definitely would say that, you know, you know who your best thinkers are, who your best creatives are. Um, I would deploy them on these tools as soon as possible, rather than, of course, it can help everybody else level up, but I'm interested in who the person, the person with the best imagination gets to have an imagination unleashed with, mm. with, with AI. That's kind of it's how it's definitely not a zero sum game, for sure. Yeah, 100%.
Mark, um, if, if we're on, a, on the edge of thinking about um, what you said in the beginning, learning prompting um, to get better results out of the tools, would you re recommend that to companies to learn how to prompt, or is that a temporary phase? We will see tools well, that I'll make just it... just ask ChatGPT to write some prompts <laughs> for you. Okay, we should ask... Ch okay, next time we'll have uh, four computers here, and I'll only ask them. I but don't I think uh, that prompt engineering will be a new job profile. So it's really temporary from my perspective. For only a certain phase, because all the tools will inc incorporate ways of making prompting easier. Uh, I guess really, let's say in the future... And you, you have now, so, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, you have now tools like Prompt Perfect, for example. Um, you just, you know, you imagine whatever prompt you have, you just throw it up there and it gives you a good prompt back. Prompt Perfect, write it down. Yeah. But I think you're right, it's like an intermediary step, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. I mean, the systems will get uh, so smart that they just don't know, ask additional questions to you if it is not 100% clear what you mean, right? I would say it's more getting then in an uh, interactive mode or something like that, but uh, I really don't see any, let's say, prompt engineers uh, in the future. What is interesting in the voice space with uh, things like um, Alexa and so on, Hopefully, there's no Alexa speakers here <laughs> that are going to go off. Um, but, you know, Alexa doesn't care about the syntax, right? It doesn't care which order you say the words in. It's just trying to listen for the key words and understand your intent. Today, with prompt engineering, syntax matters in, in the uh -huh. sense that, you know, the way in which you form your prompts matters because you get a certain output depending on, on how you form uh, the sentence uh, or the prompt. I think that will change. I think it, I think it will, I think it will become a lot better at understanding intent. I think that there'll be uh, more UI-centric tools that also allow you to engage with the outputs much more. And frankly, I think that's all coming within within a 12-month window. I don't think it's but, far but away. But I, I think I think AI people um, would, would would discuss on that because uh, the idea of the large language models is to predict the next um, uh, the the uh, how do you say it? Um, the Wahrscheinlichkeit. Probability. The probability of the, of the next word. And um, so that depends on you have to spell the f word before correctly. Um, so it's a totally different model if I try to understand what's really the intent. I think to, today that's you're 100% right. But, uh, you know, I misspell at least seven out of ten <laughs> words in Google when I'm writing an email and it fixes them. So, I, yeah. again, I think these tools already exist. It's just a matter of the integration and... Uh, I guess, conversion, uh, convergence of all of these things. And I mean, what also is uh, interesting is that all, let's say, the major um, kind of developments or models will get multimodal, right? So you can right. then also just upload, don't know, uh, a picture where you have drawn something and then the AI is understanding what you probably want to uh, get out of it. But you have to remember, today's tools are like the kindergarten of tools, right? It's like just started. Yeah. So if you actually push forward and think about its more logical conclusion, what you've actually got is an interactive process with a computer. You're going to create something from start to finish. You're going to lock yourself in a room like the old-fashioned creative process, like we're not coming out of this room till we've written a song. And at the end of it, you know, it's like, no, just play the track, just play the track, you know, and layering things up again and again. So I think, you know, this transactional thing that we have today is going to develop into something where it's more layered and interactive. We, talk, we talked about the, the idea of uh, better personalization in, in the navigation structure. Um, will we see um, sort of more satellite shops that are dedicated to certain personas, to certain topics, that are more, even more niche, even longer on the long tail than before? I would say that uh, we will not need personas anymore in the future. So that is probably, as it was always hard for me to understand in, in the direction of, let's say if you have thousands of customers and you create 10 personas, I'm pretty sure it doesn't help you really to, to create additional kind of experience uh, for the customer or something. And that is, let's say, the interesting thing that with the technology that is now available, you um, can potentially think about doing content optimization really on a user level, right? So you know, I don't know, this person was uh, recently buying uh, this or that product, and then you can include this information, also not you, but the, let's say AI in the background to create tailor-made um, messages so that the 
user is visiting the store and get like a personal welcome with all the, don't know, necessary or um, important products that could perfectly like enhance his experience or something like that. So that this a field um, where I would say uh, it's in the end then really putting the human in the center and optimizing it really for everybody individual. But I think there's, there's one, one gap in this, in this argument is that we have um, our existing customers and we have a relation with them and we have a consent to use their data. And we have our new customers, we don't have a relation, we don't have the consent. And um, if there is one risk in, in AI, in, in, for example, conversational systems, then it's about the, the flood of data that's going out of the, the transaction between um, shopper and, and online shop. And uh, regulation will come into play there, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So uh, we could use both. We could, we could do the persona model where users are anonymous, where I don't have the data to personalize, and then you know get more granular, granular the more I know the, the people. Yeah. Well, let's say the, the service that is uh, offered after login is really so great that everybody just want to log in, right? So it could also be. Uh, sure, yeah. yeah. Like, um, with big other companies sometimes. <laughs> Occasionally it happens. What do you think? Um, to all of you, um, we had this um, one stream that's called Conversational Commerce, um, which led a couple of companies to use WhatsApp, for example, for accompanying uh, customers um, through their shopping experience. On, on the other hand, AI and generative AI, will that come together? So will we use an avatar on, on um, WhatsApp, for example, to let us guide through a shopping process? I mean, I'll just say that I find it annoying as hell. <laughs> so, uh, There's way too many WhatsApp messages. Uh, so I, I actually don't, as a consumer anyway, I don't like it as a product person. I also think it's clumsy. I think it, it, it falls outside of the remit of uh, the experience I'm trying to create personally as a, you know, and again, as trying to wear my merchant hat for a second. I, I, I personally would prefer to have it as an in-house experience, even though I understand the reach uh, component. But I do think that um, I do think that there will be a, a component of um, I think you just touched on it. You know, personalized st stores, uh, and you know, um, my calendar is on my phone. My uh, Spotify, when I open it, is basically only music that I will probably like, according to Spotify playlisted. I think there's a, and Amazon, I guess, is the closest thing today to a store which is ready made for stuff that I'm probably going to buy uh, on a whim. But I think that there is a, there will, I think we will go back to a point where we want that kind of physical world like experience of being drawn in for, through something that directly connects with us visually or, 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 uh, or otherwise. And then I think there is a guided experience that you get inside of a physical store that a chatbot in its current form I don't feel gives you, which I do think that today we augment through content that we create on social platforms and other things. Um, and it's difficult to really imagine what that future could be, but I think it is much more a bridging of that gap in experience between the physical store and, um, and, and, the, and the person with the knowledge who shows you around and doing that virtually. So not sure what that experience looks like today, but I definitely feel that the tools we're discussing will have a big part to play. Well, that's, it's, it's really funny because uh, the, one of the next speakers that will be on stage after us tried to do that with a big German company. Um, uh, they have 1,500 outlets throughout uh, Germany. And he said, okay, in the morning there's no customers coming. Uh, so I can use all of these 1,500 people um, to be um, shopping guides in, in, in the online store. Um, well, he didn't think of German trade unions. <laughs> that, that was really a problem in that. So let, let's turn it to the other round. You, you see, guys, um, we should have been over um, 10 minutes ago, but actually there's a speaker missing, so I'm <laughs> continuing on, on talking. So we're just going to keep Relax. on fucking talking. We still, still have time. I promise you, at, at late, latest at six, I'll leave you out to get a beer, but then come back and we'll talk on. Um, where do you see risks um, in, in what ha what's happening there right now? We have big companies bringing out really severe stuff, like, um, for example, Microsoft with OpenAI, um, on a level where maybe it's not that user-tested enough. 
Um, is, is there, are there risks out there? Um, should we, you know, have a profound discussion on ethics, use of these tools? Also, I mean, definitely we should, but we should not make the, let's say, mistake that we often do, especially in Germany, to only, or let's say, to focus too much on the risk, because of risks are always there, right? And um, from my perspective, I think what really will uh, getting more and more important is um, to really have clear understanding of what does it mean in the daily operational work of a company. So let's say marketing communication. So if you can do 80% with technology like ChatGPT, uh, what does it mean for your workforce, right? And that is something um, where I think a lot about um, because of it's not only marketing, it's also writing code, it's also don't know, doing Photoshop or creating videos, right? So it's covering nearby every aspect of, um, yeah, of uh, what is typical in a digital business today. And therefore, I think um, it's really important that uh, yeah, not only the government and not only the EU or the US, so that in general, um, we all together find a good approach on how to work with this kind of technology. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So now we're pushed off stage. Uh, let's do um, a final round, a very short one. Every one of you, just one sentence to the audience, um, which are merchants in, in the plural. Um, what should they do to be able to see whether generative AI can be helpful to them? Mark, you start. Just try it out, basically. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing You said else to it, it has a long learning curve. So if I try it out, then crap comes out, and I say, okay, that's not it. Well, if you want to learn to play an instrument, you've got to start playing the guitar, right? You know, you've got to start somewhere. So, so just start practicing, see, see how you get on, ask other people, try stuff out, share things online. That's the best way to start. Try it out. And in the uh, back end, for example, Stefan, how is that? In, in the back end, in the processes, in, in the, within, within the company itself. Yeah. That is um, basically what I, let's say, meant also with thinking about what does it mean for the workforce, etc. Also from my understanding, I would say it should be definitely a very strategic topic within every company. So it should be like that also the, let's say, C-level or the people that are in charge are really spending time in uh, trying and finding out how it works and what it can mean for, let's say, the individual business, because of there will be a strong and uh, hard impact. And uh, yeah, I guess that as it always is, right? There will be a lot of winners, but there will also be a lot of people that not get the space and the speed of adaptability. And therefore, yeah, my recommendation would be really take it serious. Yeah, and then um, what you say is perfectly right on, on a C-level. I had a conference two days ago when I asked my audience and I had about a quarter of what, 50 percent have tried ChatGPT. In this room, as I heard yesterday, it was 90 percent. Um, so um, take your leaders with you. Uh, in the creative space, um, how can I get real good content out of the tools? Um, I think... Uh, um, prompt engineering? No, I'm joking. Uh, I, I definitely, I definitely think that. Um, Can we learn that on Mind Valley? <laughs> well, I was gonna. I was, you could actually. Actually, it's coming up, uh, starting next month. But I, what I, what I will say is, um, I was really excited to see the roadmap earlier, just as a, as a product and design person. Um, I think now is the time that we're moving from Wild West territory, and it's going to be around for a little bit longer, to companies like uh, Shopware and others. You know, creating. I think the tools, the tools built on those foundational elements that uh, can actually help us get to the point of, is this going to help me or not in the short term? And so um, I, you know, the identification of what's inside your image, for example, immediately spitting out those tags and even descriptive factors, leveraging those things into uh, a prompt for something like mid journey, you can make alternative images, uh, you know, uh, getting your descriptions to be better written or, or, or kind of regurgitated in a, in, in, in a tone that might be more relevant for a user. These types of tools are now emerging. So I would say work within the sandbox of um, companies and tools that you're comfortable with and see if that makes a material impact to what you're doing creatively. Brian, what is the one um, utmost topic where shoppers are waiting for, if, even if they don't know it, what we can ameliorate in the front end of a shop? Say that again, sorry. Where we can ameliorate the front end of a shop, like the, the whole customer-facing stuff. 
customer facing stuff. Yeah, so I, I actually, I'm, I, I'm gonna echo your words. I think that the answer here is to use the tools that are in your licensed software agreement. <laughs> uh, because uh, right now, a lot of companies are discouraging or, or um, you know, or at least turning a blind eye to using chat GPT in personal workflows. Wild Wild West is an apt description for where we're at right now. We are early stage. Everything that's being done is a one-off. Uh, it's completely custom. It either just comes out of someone's brain or it's to address a specific project, and it's typically skunk works, right? It's, it's something that's done without approval. The way the world's gonna change is through approved tools. And right now, even then, it's still a lot of experimentation, but start looking for resources around best practices on how to use those tools. They're gonna emerge. Um, you don't necessarily have to be the early bird. You can be the second mouse. F find educational resources to, to guide you on how to do this. Um, and I bet you there might be some coming from Shopware soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. There's still, still one from me because I was at a, a generative AI conference uh, two days ago and uh, I had a prompt engineer on stage and she said, if you're not content with the content that ChatGPT creates for you from your zero shot prompt, then just take all of the answer, post it again into ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT what's bad about this answer. And it will answer about his own answer, what was bad. And then you can see how things get better. Thanks a lot, you guys. And uh, Thank you. have a good Thank evening you. here at Shopware Community Day.